everyone hear me? Yes. Everyone awake? Yes. I know I'm the only thing between you and lunch, so I'll try to keep it in. <laughs> uh, uh, my name's Daniel. Uh, I'm uh, the Director of Government Affairs with the Texas Chemical Council. Um, John said, do you have a bio? And I said, well, not really on me. Um, but So he said, well, tell them a little bit about yourself. So um, I've been with the Chemical Council for just over three years. Prior to that, uh, I worked uh, as chief of staff to the chairman at the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, which is the state's environmental agency. Um, prior to that, I spent a number of years in the Capitol uh, working as a, a communications uh, director, speech writer, and uh, environmental uh, policy analyst for a couple of different state senators. Uh, and I went to school in Nashville. I'm originally from Texas, but I went to school in Nashville at Belmont University, which is a uh, private school uh, in Nashville. So that's a little bit about me, and now we're going to get started. Um, I do uh, want to thank everyone for being here and attending uh, STI. It's uh, an honor for uh, Chemical Council to be a part of STI to bring our members, the various sponsors uh, that John mentioned, uh, in to, to also help, help uh, fund the, the, the uh, workshop. So today I just want to talk to you a little bit about what the Chem Chemical Council is, and give you a little bit of history on the chemical industry. Uh, as a whole in, in the state as well, um, talk a little bit about economic impact of the industry um, from the state's perspective, uh, visit a little bit about the environmental story we have to tell um, and about the products we make, uh, and then uh, exactly what we do at the Chemical Council, because uh, I've given this pre presentation uh, a couple of years now, and I go through it, and then at the end everyone goes, well, what exactly do you do? So uh, I'll let you know. Basically, the mission of the Chemical Council is to create a globally competitive environment for the chemical industry in Texas in a manner that is positive for the state of Texas and its citizens. Um, we represent about 70 member companies. These are companies that you recognize. It's ExxonMobil, the ones you see on here, Dow, Bayer, Lionel, uh, Eastman, Lubrizol, uh, a lot of companies, obviously, that are uh, in and around uh, Houston operating the ship channel. Um, those 70 companies have about 200 facilities across the state. Um, most, again, are around Houston. Uh, a lot of the, in Corpus, uh, they tend to be in kind of port areas uh, where they can easily get products in and out. Uh, but over 200 facilities across the state, and we employ, those companies employ um, just over 70,000 people. Um, we also, in another sister association that uh, we also represent is the Association of Chemical Industry of Texas. These guys are the suppliers, the distributors, um, the other kind of uh, entities that operate in and around a larger chemical uh, facility, so uh, we also represent them. A little bit of history about the chemical industry. Um, it really began after the onset of World War II, or around the time of World War II. Uh, factories were built uh, to convert raw materials into things that were needed for the war. Um, a lot along the East Coast, but obviously, again, as I mentioned just uh, earlier, uh, they also you know, would crop up around you know, the shipping uh, ports. Uh, you know, that was the main source of transportation uh, to, to move large quantities of products at the time. Um, after the war, the focus turned to supplying everyday you know, uh, chemicals that people use to make you know, continue to make things. By the 60s, the chemical industry was established uh, well here in the state and has been um, a strong component of the Texas economy ever since then. Um, the chemical industry in Texas supplies thousands of products, um, not only to other companies in Texas, but to companies around the world. I mean, we make chemicals that we sell or that they sell to another company that then makes plastic bags. Um, or they ship it overseas and it's made into something over there. So it's, it's uh, a lot of what goes on around the world and in the United States happens, starts right here. Let me talk a little bit about the uh, economic uh, impact and contribution that the chemical industry makes um, for the state. Uh, as I mentioned, we employ just over 70,000 people, uh, or the, the, the members that we represent employ those people. Um, and for every chemical industry job in, a tech, in Texas, an additional four and a half jobs are created within the economy. 
So again, kind of going back to the distributors and suppliers and smaller manufacturers, it's those guys, but it's also contractor groups. Um, when our members have you know, big capital investments and uh, you know, they're putting in new scrubbers or crackers at their facility, they hire contractor groups to do a lot of that construction. And so uh, a lot of the facilities uh, employ uh, other people to, to help run and, and maintain uh, the facility. Um, we also, the, the companies also give a lot of money uh, in various taxes and uh, in community uh, relations as well. But uh, in Harris County alone, chemical companies contribute about $12 billion annually to the local economy. I mentioned taxes. When it comes to taxes, we certainly um, are happy to contribute to the, the, the local economy. As you can imagine, the assets that we have on the ground uh, in equipment and infrastructure uh, are worth quite a bit of money. And so uh, it is a capital intensive industry. Uh, we provide more than our fair share, or happy to pay our fair share of state and local, local taxes. Um, that is just uh, generally over a billion dollars each year. So when it comes to the environment, I'm sure, especially living in Houston, you also you hear a lot about pollution and um, ozone action days or uh, various uh, emissions at uh, different facilities. Um, the environment is a big deal, not only to the Chemical Council, but we continue to, to push that message to our members, and it's, it's a big deal to, the members, uh, to our members as well, the companies that we represent. Uh, it's not only important to protect the environment, but it's even more importantly to protect the people that are working in, in the plants and in the communities that live and, and operate around, around these facilities. Um, our members work hand in hand with TCQ, again, the state's environmental agency. Um, they receive permits from TCQ to operate to, um, from everything for air permits, for you know, emissions events, to water discharges, um, anything that you, you need to run a chemical plant, you pretty much get it from TCQ, the, the state's environmental agency. Um, another thing that's important that the state does is they operate the Texas Emissions Reduction Program. In 2001, um, the legislature, the Texas legislature, decided that they would allocate a portion of money to go to mobile emissions. Um, the state is precluded by federal law of regulating cars, vehicles, um, and the emissions that come out of those vehicles. But in the big metropolitan areas, those are the largest emissions uh, when it comes to NOx. And so the state said, hey, we're gonna start allocating a pool of money every year that people can go apply for grants uh, to get new and cleaner engines. And so since 2001, these numbers are a little dated, um, it's well over 10,000 projects now, uh, and the state's spent over a billion dollars on turning over old vehicles and old engines and replacing them with cleaner. That could be a cleaner burning diesel, um, a, some sort of low sulfur diesel, but it's a way that the state said, hey, we're regulating industry and we're trying to keep their emissions low, but the other big um, elephant in the room, so to speak, are cars, and since we can't regulate cars, we'll try to incentivize people to change their old you know, diesel engines out. Um, there's been a lot of kind of spin-offs um, since they did that. They have a, another program that's called uh, Drive a Clean Machine, and it gives money for um, electric vehicles um, and other sorts of uh, low emission type vehicles. Uh, it's just a, it was a good way for the state to say, hey, we're gonna, you know, we're regulating industry, but we're also going to um, try to do the job the feds do on the national level by um, keeping cars more efficient, but we're going to actually encourage people to get their engines switched out. It's been, it's been uh, very successful, especially on, when it comes to like construction. Again, in the metropolitan areas, there's a lot of road construction, a lot of big diesel type engines, cranes, you know, street uh, highway construction machines that are used, steam rollers, things like that. And so they can have those engines replaced and retrofitted, uh, and it, it cuts down emissions a lot. <coughs> when it 
when you have uh, 20 plus refineries and over 40 chemical facilities in the ship channel, obviously security is um, a large factor, um, especially in a post September 11 uh, world. So um, security and safety uh, is something that our company uh, is high, uh, holding highest regard. Um, it, you know, they, they uh, operate in a manner which, uh, again, tries to protect the employees that are working in, in the facilities, but also um, bearing in mind that a lot of communities have developed around the various uh, industrial plants. And so we want to make sure that those uh, the facility is operating in a safe manner uh, that also keeps the community um, safe as well. Uh, I think later in the week you're going to hear from a CAP member, which, a, which is a community action panel, uh, and, and these, uh, these panels operate in and around uh, facilities. They meet with the community on a regular basis to hear what their concerns are, whether that be a noise concern or an odor concern. Um, whatever you know, the community uh, is having a problem with at the time, uh, the CAP meets and tries to, to, uh, to reconcile that with the community so that they're operating uh, in, in a friendly manner. But most of the facilities use state-of-the-art uh, technology to help protect employees and the, uh, the public and the, and the assets. Um, we obviously work close with OSHA and the Department of Homeland Security uh, to help ensure you know, that the facilities um, are protected from any sort of attack. Uh, the ship channel, for instance, is uh, patrolled regularly by the Coast Guard uh, and other law enforcement. I know Harris County uh, also uh, is involved in those endeavors. So what most people don't realize is how important chemistry is to your just everyday life um, and, and the products. Obviously, uh, I mentioned uh, plastics earlier. A lot of what our companies make are things that go into making plastics. And so what I want to do is I want to go through some of these areas here and, and point out some of the things that uh, are involved uh, in, making, in making different products and, and what, where, they, where they end up. So when it comes to the environment, um, a lot of things. We make you know, the fibers that go in air filters for your homes. Um, solar power, a couple pictures here. Solar powered, uh, they have uh, the, the wind turbines are obviously made of plastic. Resins are made to, to, to make the plastic that goes into making the wind turbines. And then solar power, we have several companies now that are making solar shingles. So you can put solar shingles on your house, it obviously generates power, it takes you a little bit off of the electric grid. Um, but then, uh, obviously, in, in general, um, these products are used to make more uh, renewable energy, which is, of course, uh, takes the load down from what the state has to generate for everyday use. When it comes to healthcare, um, obviously, medicines uh, that make medicines that go on patches that you put on your body. Um, also, we have companies that are involved in nanotechnology, which basically delivers medicines to specific cells in your body. Um, and then uh, also the machines that you go, if you had a CAT scan or an MRI or any of those sort of things that you have to go and sit in, it's surrounded obviously by plastic. When it comes to food, you probably don't like to think about chemicals that you put in your body, but they're all safe, obviously, or you, they wouldn't be allowed to put in your body. Um, but other things that are used, uh, like Ziploc bags, um, obviously those help keep food fresher longer. Um, we also have companies that are involved with the military and make uh, MREs, which is meals ready to eat. It's what the troops use in the, on the battlefield. They mix it up and then uses chemicals to um, basically kind of cook the food and warm it up, uh, and then they're able to, to, to eat that. Lifestyle choices. So basically your home from the front door to the back door, the roof to the slab, tons of chemistry. Okay, I know I've already mentioned air filters and, and uh, other things, but PVC pipe, obviously made of chemicals, uh, insulation, Resins are used in uh, some cabinets and countertops, shelves, floors, furniture. Uh, it's, it's everywhere. And when it comes to clothing, how many people get their clothes dry clean? You take something to the cleaners to get it clean, get a stain out. 
Obviously, chemicals are used to do all that. Chemicals are also put on your clothes before you buy them to help hold the color in uh, and the dye that's, that's used to make the colors on your clothes. So obviously, uh, another way that chemicals are being used there. Also, when it comes to sports, I'm sure everyone watches sports on TV or, you know, balls have plastic in them, golf balls, basketballs, uh, hockey pucks. Uh, and then when it comes to the protection of players, shoulder pads, helmets, uh, you know, all, all kinds of things uh, there that are used, they're all made from chemicals. Who drove here this morning? Oh, hang on a second. I skipped one. Technology. Technology. How, who has an iPhone? Blackberry? Right? Also, chemicals are used to make the rechargeable batteries that are not only used in the phones, but also used in lithium-ion lithium batteries um, and other devices like that. So, now, who drove here this morning? Your car? You ever think about what's in your, like, what's inside your car? How about the tires? Made of plastic, right? I have a statistic here. Uh, plastics make up 50% of the volume, but only 10% of the total weight of the car. So, plastics I mean, making things lighter, which translates to things being more efficient, and then obviously the lower uh, vehicle emissions. Kind of along the same lines of healthcare, but safety when it comes to medicine. Childproof bottles, you know how you have to fight to get that thing off when you get the prescription. Um, so childproof bottles, and then how about sinus medicine or cold medicine, with the little package, you have to pop the pill out, and you're just like, getting frustrated because you can't get it out. No? <laughs> Recycling too. Um, how many people recycle at home? Oh, wow, a lot of people. Um, chlorine is used to help break down aluminum cans once they're transported to recycling facilities, um, which you're going to go to tomorrow, obviously. Um, everyone is different, but chlorine is uh, used generally at most of those places. Um, also, chlorine, how about a swimming pool to keep it clean, keep it sanitary? You know, so people use chlorine uh, in swimming pools. So you don't really realize how many things chemicals are used in or used in the making of until you really, to really stop and think about it. I know I've mentioned a bunch today, but just think about what you've done today. You woke up this morning, turn the alarm clock off, right? You take a shower. Did you use shampoo? It was in a plastic bottle? Did you, did you brush your teeth? Plastic toothbrush, probably. Um, you, you know, again, cell phones, you probably use your cell phone at least once today already. I saw some people outside on the break talking on their phone, doing work. And then you drove here in your car, which, just the next time you get in your car, look how much is made of plastic, the dash. Uh, and that's just the stuff you can see. You can't see, you know, underneath um, where the, the rest of the plastic is, too. So. Um, so now here's the part where I tell you what I really do. So again, the Chemical Council is a statewide trade association made up of about 70 member companies, which we, I've already mentioned some. Um, it was created in 1953, and the council was the first statewide trade association devoted to the chemical industry in the nation. So Texas Chemical Council was the first chemical trade association in the country. The reason it was created uh, initially was um, to protect those companies from paying higher taxes. A lot of companies um, around that time were being deemed to pay more taxes, and so the council was created to go to basically the state capital uh, and lobby to keep taxes on industry low. Since that time, um, we basically lobby um, legislature uh, in Austin and various regulatory bodies on whatever our companies need, um, whether that be uh, environmental protection, health and safety, some sort of civil justice issue, electricity rates, or energy. Um, we, we, we're involved in a number of things. Obviously, um, taxes is still very important to all the companies we pay, um, or that are members of ours. Um, 
and the environmental uh, component is a big issue to them as well. So I would say that taxes and the environment is what we spend the majority of our time on, but um, we pretty much do whatever um, our members uh, need. It. The way the council structured is we have some internal committees um, that meet on a quarterly basis. This is uh, different committees. We have an air committee, a water and waste committee, a safety committee, and then the outreach committee, which is um, a, a big uh, part of SDI and uh, a big reason that you guys are able to attend. But basically, on, when it comes to the regulatory areas, air, water, waste, and safety, those committees meet um, quarterly, generally. Um, and it's really meant to be a sh best, best uh, sharing of best practices amongst the members. I mean, these, these, uh, the people that make up that committee work at all these different companies. And so they come together and they say, you know, at the safety committee, uh, hey, we had a worker get hurt. He um, had some sort of valve that wasn't secured. And when he turned it, it blew steam in his face and he fell and broke his arm. Now, hopefully that doesn't happen, and it is very rare. But then they talk about, well, how do you, you know, how do you fix that? How do you prevent that from happening again? And so that happens uh, not only in the safety committee, but in the air committee. Um, someone might say on the air committee, um, we, uh, we got a fine from TCEQ because, uh, you know, we had uh, some sort of emissions event and they exceeded our permit, you know, what our permit allowed. And, um, they talk about amongst themselves you know, what can we do to help prevent that? You know, more specific to the to the situation. Um, so that's kind of how the internal their internal uh, workings of the of the uh, council work. Um, and then basically, we take um, the various things that uh, those committees are working on, and we go to TCEQ or the Railroad Commission or the Public Utility Commission um, or the State Capitol, and we lobby for changes or we try to prevent things from being changed depending on the specific regulations so while i'm not jack abramoff um, you know i do lobby on behalf of the chemical industry um, i think that the changes um, over the last few years that we've been able to make uh, in a number of areas um, they're good for our company's operation but at the same time um, they're still very protective of the public, uh, the environment, and so uh, we, we don't. We try not to. Um, we, we, we tell our. We do tell our members no if they say, "Hey, we want you to go to the legislature and make it so that we don't have to do X, Y, Z to get a permit." Then, and, and if, it, if we thought it was obviously bad enough, they would say, "No, we don't. We don't think that's responsible." Um, obviously, we, we live in a world where corporations um, are existing, you know, some of them exist to make money for their shareholders, uh, and we totally get that, um, but at the end of the day, we still have to be responsible to the citizens that live here and uh, to, the, to the public uh, and for their protection. So um, that is a little bit about the chemical council and the chemical industry, and I'm happy to answer any questions. There's always questions. Yes, <laughs> but in terms of recycling, like I mean, we all benefit from everything that we talk about. But how much of a car can be recycled as far as like resins or carpeting or any of the stuff that we're using constantly that winds up in landfills? How much of that can be recycled? Um, honestly, I do not know the answer to that question. I would tell you that um, I would think it'd be quite a bit. I mean, obviously, there's there's a metal metal obviously in cars and the plastic as well. Um, when you get down to things like the carpets and, um, you know, there's going to be an element of that that would probably be able to be recycled and it would end up in the landfill or incinerated or something like that. But I, I would guess the vast majority of a car um, could probably be recycled in some, some form or fashion. Yeah. 